Hello, everyone. It looks like most of our attendees have logged in. Thank you for joining us today for Remembering Rwanda, a panel discussion commemorating and drawing lessons from the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. My name is Georgia Bauer, and I'm a student at the University of Houston Law Center, where I serve as president of the International Law Society. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Our panelists and attendees are participating from all across different cities, states, and even from a few different countries today. And so we thank you all for joining us in whatever time zone you are in. Today's discussion was intentionally planned during the month of April because April is Genocide Awareness Month. During this month of remembrance, we dedicate time to learn from and honor the victims of genocide throughout history. Genocides in Armenia and Cambodia started during this month and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising commemorated by Yom HaShoah, which is Holocaust Remembrance Day, also began in this month. This month marks the 29th anniversary of the beginning of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, during which more than 1 million people were mur murdered in approximately 100 days between April and June of 1994. In remembrance of all of those murdered during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and other genocides, including the Armenian and Cambodia genocides and the Holocaust, I would now ask that you all join me in a moment of silence. Thank you all for joining me in that moment of remembrance. Now, it's my privilege to introduce our speakers for today's panel. First, I have the honor of introducing both Henriette Mutawagraba and Providence Umu Gweneza, who will share their testimonies as survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Henriette Mutawagraba is the author of the book, By Any Means Necessary, Healing and Forgiveness After Genocide, and the founder of the, Millions, the Million Lives Genocide Relief Fund. Henriette also serves as a board member of One Tribe, an organization that works to rebuild and empower war impacted communities. Henriette is preparing to travel to New York tomorrow to speak to the United Nations, and we thank her for taking the time to speak to us today. Providence Umuguaneza is the author of the book, Next Couple Hours, and founder of the Cabo, Cabejo Nezo Initiative. Providence advocates for other survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi and is a commissioner of the Texas Holocaust Genocide Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. Providence is joining us from Geneva, Switzerland, where she will also be speaking to the United Nations and where it is currently very late at night. We are very grateful that you're taking the time to speak to us today. Next, I would like to introduce Professor Zachary Kaufman. Professor Kaufman is currently the William and Patricia Clay Visiting Professor in International Law at Boston University School of Law while on leave from the University of Houston Law Center, where he's an Associate Professor of Law and Political Science and Co-Director of the Criminal Justice Institute. Professor Kaufman will be speaking to us today about the legal and historical aftermath of the genocide against the Tutsi. Professor Kaufman has published several books and more than 40 articles and book chapters, many of which focus on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Additionally, he has worked at the US Department of Justice to assist in the Rwandan Ministry of Justice in processing the backlog of genocide prosecutions. And he served at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda on the team that successfully prosecuted Theones de Bagasara, the military commander of the genocide. Professor Kaufman is joining us today from Boston, Massachusetts, and we thank you for joining us today. One last thank you to the many co-sponsors of this event, which are the American Society of International Law's Human Rights Interest Group and Southeast Interest Group, the University of Houston Law Center's Criminal Justice Institute, International Law Society, Initiative on Global Law and Policy for the Americas, and the Houston Journal of International Law, the Association of American Law School's International Human Rights Section and International Law Section, the Law and Society Association's Collaborative Research Network on Transitional Justice, and the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. As one last thing before our esteemed speakers begin their remarks, I do want to note that today's discussion will cover potentially triggering topics, including genocide, rape, and other sexual offenses, and violence against children. After our panels deliver their remarks, 
We will open up the conversation for Q&A, which will be submitted through written comments on the Zoom platform. So please save any questions for that time. With that, I welcome you, Henriette. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to join you today at the University of Houston's Law School for this time of remembering Rwanda and considering what can be learned from the 1994 genocide, to, uh, genocide against the Tutsi people. My best guess, though I could be wrong, is there is no too frequent talk about law and genocide in many law school classrooms. But this is exceptional with regard to examining trans transitional justice mechanism after the mass atrocities in Rwanda is compelling. And I'm grateful for this important work. While such, personal, uh, while such provisional apparatus like the post-genocide Rwanda and Gachacha courts were variable alongside the more conventional courts, while well, they helped revealing the dark truth of aggressions uh, of evil our nation and people had endured, while well, they added in bringing about some redress of grave human rights abuse and began first step in recall, restoring survivors toward the possibility of peace, reconciliation, democratic freedom, and restore the dignity, they will and they are not substitute for the prevention of genocide. Forging a bridge back toward the justice, no matter how adaptive and well constructed might be, can never negate the brokenness in the attempt to, re to reorder and heal. I know this in a way no member of this human family should have to know. The perspective I bring to you today is not hypothetical or objective. It is not detached or devoid of oppression. Although I am a firm believer in rule of law and the major process, due process of it gives in a center and strength. You see, genocide is deeply personal to me. And uh, so it is a solid understanding of what could prevent and give it appropriate consequences where it has occurred. The role can do both of those things, where it exists and where it can be enforced. Impunity is powerful and it is countermeasure is not so much of punishment as it is enforcement of what which will lend it in accountable. Please hold that thought as you consider my story. 29 years ago, the history of genocide was repeated in Rwanda, when nearly a million of Tutsi people and Hutu were murdered in less than 100 days. There have certainly been other genocide throughout history, and genocide and its companion democide, which is the killing of people by their own governments, still continue happening today. And while all genocide, all killing, and the structure of people based on their race, region, ethnicity, nationality, it is an evil of epic proportional, an international mass scale crisis, and a national devastation of incalculable magnitude, this genocide nearly 30 years ago was first personal to me. It was personal because in April 1994, my country became forever different as the world stood by watching a million of Tutsi people being brutally slaughtered. The chronicles of Rwandan history remain of entrenched and long running tribal division, division that should not be because all human beings are created in image of God. And tangling deep region conflicts in history, we gained the much greater understanding of, of root causes. But an exam and address those are systematically escorted from division into hatred. Then such hatred was incited and inflamed by perverse propaganda that finally culminated a hundred days killing frenzy. A million of people were extinguished in less than hundred days. That is just over three months. It had to take. It is hard to take that in, isn't it? Just for a point of reference, consider the population of Austin, Texas, where there's last three million people. Dallas has 1.3 million. And me this aftermath, as we do the worthy diligence of what went wrong, 
What was so broken to cause life for so many? We find the matters we often don't want to talk about. Things like the corruption and corruption at the highest level of a government that not only fails to defend those to whom it is charged to protect, but a government that sometimes shakes hands with the devil by both allowing atrocities to continue without interruption. And at the same time, helping back and perpetrate the very evil of which they would be responsible to prevent and end. We had early warnings in Rwanda. For those less familiar with anatomy of genocide, it follows a highly predictable pattern. It doesn't just show up and happen overnight. Rather, it moves in systematically alongside in the degrees over months, years. Sadly, those architecting genocide know precisely what they are intended. They know exactly how to act, act and carry it out. We are reminded of this as we, work, we look backward at the Romanian genocide where the first world war was used as a cover to annihilate 1.5 million. We have the Holocaust where more than 6 million Jewish people and million of others were exterminated, this time under the cover of World War II. Then there was Cambodia, Bosnia, South Sudan and Darfur. Genocide, despite our having sufficient international legal instruments and law to prevent and stop it, despite a show of commitment to never again, is not extinguished. Just as a million of two people, of which I'm one, were exterminated in 100 days at the behest of their own government, so too, a hundred of Anyamurenge and Congo DRC are being killed as I'm speaking today. There is also ongoing forced labor and brutality against the Uyghur Muslim minority in China. The list continues throughout the history, rarely rising to prominence, because it is not in the interest of those entities devising and funding such atrocities. The global community typically remains either unaware or conditioned to turn a blind eye and remain silent. This was our history of blood, the bloody Rwanda Spring. At the highest level, the world leaders failed us. Our Rwandan former government failed us. Those national and international head of state and institutions ignored the national and international law. They disregarded human rights convention, including the 1948 Convention of Prevention of Punishment of the Genocide of the Crime of Genocide. They corroded in their non-response and watched two sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and husbands, wives and children were murdered. When advocates and whistleblowers stepped up and interrupted the atrocities and act as a voice on our behalf, they were ignored and silenced. You already know the end of this story. No help came to us as a Tutsi woman with brutal raped, as the churches filled with the Tutsi people burned to ashes, and Tutsi born, blood and bones cried out from the streets of Tigari and beyond. There was only international silence. At a personal level, I lost my entire family, with exception with one sister. I lost my mother, my father, my four siblings. I lost 60 people during that time. For those of us who survived, this has meant years, decades of trying to piece together what happened to our Rwanda. What went so heartless wrong and how it is that human might plan and act such evil and hatred against each other. For me, not a single day passes without such contemplation. My efforts to understand helped me arrive at the truth I wish were and true. I have come to realize and grapple with the deeper evil I wish did not exist. In a closing, I want us to remember and celebrate the, the, the extraordinary ways in which we have moved forward. As individuals, as a family, as a Rwandan communities. When I say move forward, I understand I'm not dismissing that we have suffered. I'm not. A, forgetting the immeasurable pain and impact that this genocide has on the Tutsi people in our Rwanda, our country. 
Rather, I'm saying that despite the devastating odds, we have not given up. We have held on and chosen to do the hard and painful work of building a new life. We have a continual trust in God, turning to him and toward each other. Some of us raised our young siblings and raised them very well. Many went on and attended and graduated from universities. Those have become vocational leaders who brilliantly serve their community in important capacities. Almost 30 years ago, 30 years later, Many of us have become mothers and fathers, and those show themselves to be wonderful parents raising good and strong families. Day by day, week, then month, then years by years, we have all continued living our life, remembering our past while striving for a brief and more helpful future. With God's help, we have done this. With determination and the strength of the friendship in our community, we have moved forward. And while we are not the Rwandese, we might have been, have it not been genocide 29 years ago, we are here today. We are strong and resilient. We are caring and committed and resentful. We have endured the dark of human experience and by the grace of God, not only survived, we have become men and women who have prevailed. In remembering this together, I pray we are deeply encouraged and strengthened. I pray too that men and women like you who are in or will enter the legal ambit and who may someday find themselves facing with how to respond to atrocities present outside the ministry's attention or notice, will invoke and defend those mechanisms that protect human freedoms dignity and well-being. As I shared earlier, impunity is powerful. It is a countermeasure is not a much punishment as it is enforcement of what which will land it accountable. I am deeply grateful for this response of transition justice mechanism and their restorative possibility. They're important. But even most importantly, genocide should be prevented. And it can be prevented if there is the will and the courage to do so. Please allow my presence here today to bear witness and the reminder of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity given to me to be able to share my story also to touch base about uh, the atrocities that are taking place in the world of today. <clears throat> um, I can say that uh, the genocide, when it happened, I was 11 years old. Can you all hear, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I was 11 years old and uh, the genocide took away my five siblings and my parents and the rest of my extended family. I can say about 50 family members included um, my um, cousins, uncles and aunties. Everybody was killed and uh, only three of us, my two sisters and myself were, were able to survive. <clears throat> I was born and raised in Rwanda. <clears throat> in Eastern Province, and uh, I was the fifth child in a family of eight. So including my parents, uh, we were at uh, 10 family members. Both of my family, as I told you, my nuclear family were killed. And uh, mm -hmm. during the genocide, we have to highlight that Tutsi were supposed to be killed with machetes or knives or other sharp weapons to make them suffer. Women, <clears throat> excuse me, women, they were abused and tortured. Uh, mutilation was one of the ways Tutsi's female uh, victims were killed by. <coughs> I lost my best friends, those were my cousins and 
the first friends I made when I was going to school. I lost a joy of attending a school because I was Tutsi. I didn't know I was Tutsi until my friends who were my age told me that I was Tutsi when my teacher was asking us to stand up if you're Tutsi or Hutu taking turns. So I was all the time standing up as a Hutu because I was joining my friends and they, they, were, they were the ones who were laughing at me saying, remain seated because you're Tutsi. This is not your turn. When your turn comes, you're going to stand up. <clears throat> During the genocide, we lost everyone. We, we lost everything. My neighbors, our teachers, nurses, everyone, especially those who were showing uh, a picture of being successful or thriving in their lives were the first ones to be killed. To be shot, you had to pay. Those who didn't have money, they were cut with machetes. Babies watched their parents being killed and kids um, watched their mothers being tortured and abused by the Inherahami or Hutu radicals. The genocide took place when I was visiting my aunt and uh, by the time I was going to make my way, my way back home, that's when I heard that the then president was killed in an accident um, that because the airplane that was carrying him was shut down and everybody on board died. The Tutsi <clears throat> were not killed because this plane was shut down, because Tutsis have been killed every time. Uh, one of the examples I can give is that in 1973, when President Habjarimana Juvenal was taking power from the first president, Gregory Kaibanda. So they were kind of exchanging powers, but this was uh, done in a way of coup. President Habjarimana was, uh, was taking power by force and then Tutsi got killed that time. Both presidents were Hutu, but still Tutsis were killed. So this is one of the reasons we have to bring this in the spotlight to the world that Tutsis were not killed because of this airplane that was shut down because they were all the time being killed. And this happened several years in the past until 1994 was the time they were trying to accomplish the ethnic cleansing. Nothing was going to stop the Hutu because and in Herahami to finish the Tutsis because they were dreaming of the world that their kids would ask how Tutsis used to look like. So as I said, uh, I was trying to go back home from my auntie's uh, home and then I heard that I couldn't go back home. So this time it was really, really bad. So we saw people coming from the other uh, side of the village because they were running away <clears throat> saying that Tutsis were being killed. So the same afternoon people were being killed and uh, my uncle, my dad's oldest, older brother got shot and then killed and another one was cut with machetes. So we saw a crowd of Tutsis with fear coming towards us, telling, that, telling us that where we were living, Everybody was being killed. So we started to see the smokes on the other side of the village. We, start, we started to hear these disturbing, you know, towns of Tutsi homes being pounded down. And like in an hour or so, we saw, you know, babies laying on the ground. We saw empty homes. It was really bad. And they started to sink Tutsis in the rivers and lakes. It was really, really something somebody was going to be able to define that it was happening. And it's something that I all the time struggle to understand because after the Holocaust took place several years ago, six million Jews were killed and still genocide keeps happening. Genocide, several genocides happened right after the Holocaust and no help was on the way for these victims. And we say, that this is not gonna happen and it happens again. So my uh, 
reason to do the education is to have uh, <clears throat> to make sure we are impacting our young generation, everybody to make sure we are doing a difference because if we are not doing anything, genocide may happen again. And as Harriet mentioned, it's happening. Now that we are talking, it's happening in Congo. Banyamurinja are being killed the same way Tutsis were being killed in 1994. <clears throat> Something else that I can talk about is that to fight genocide and uh, the anti-Semitism that we see rise every day. It's not a Jewish matter or genocide is not a uh, Tutsi or survivors or running matter. It's a human uh, kind matter because if one ought to be in a peaceful world, we want it to be, we want the education to be done. And this is how we're going to fight this to happen again. <clears throat> I can uh, name a few uh, of uh, ways Tutsis were killed. Those were the tortures death they went through and I decided to put them down to let people know of how our people were tortured. And uh, before they were killed, they didn't have time to rest. They didn't have time to eat. They didn't have time to get something to drink, they were tired. Instead, they, got being, they were still being, you know, they were killed and um, tortured. They didn't have an easy death, they suffered. So one of uh, five of the torturous ways I decided to share with our followers and everybody is that one uh, of my grandfather, was thrown in the toilet and he was alive. So they decided to sink him in the toilet. Another toddler baby was, his head was banged on the wall to see the baby's brain, Tutsi baby's brain. And this is something that is common for the Tutsis. Tutsi babies, especially the male, they went through torturous this because they said Tutsis are enemies and cockroaches and snakes. They had to ex exterminate everyone. My, of course, my older cousins, they were abused sexually. And by the time the militia knew the help from the RPA, Rwandan Patriotic Army, was on the way to save Tutsis, they took away their clothes and killed them naked. Two more examples that I decided to share are my uncle who decided not to give the killers his money and shredded it in their eyes, was cut with, with a machete and was sunk in the, in the lake. And then my older sister, my, the third of my family, third sister, she was sunk in the lake it's called Lake Mohaz, it's still there. And she was carrying our last born on her back. As Ellie Wiesel mentioned, when you hear a witness, you become a witness. We are doing this to impact our world and we hope that the genocide doesn't happen again. And we are trying to see that even if we do a small, a small Thing we're making sure this is going to make a difference because we want our young generation to make right decisions and to live and for the oldest member of the society to live by example. We do this also to educate the public because if you have to fight the genocide denial, the best tool to do it is to make sure we are educating the public about what happened, the genocide, and that nobody deserves to go through what we went through. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope everybody is trying to be strong for those who are remembering the killing of the Tutsis. And thank you for this platform to educate the world 
about what we went through. Maraho, which for those who don't already know means hello in Rwanda's indigenous language, Kenya Rwanda. It's a profound honor to be here today with all of you for Kwibuka 29, in which we commemorate the 29th anniversary of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Thank you to Georgia Bauer for chairing this event today. Marakoze Chane, meaning thank you very much, and Kenya Rwanda to my dear friends and colleagues, Henriette. Mutegua Raba and Commissioner Providence Umogwaneza for their brave testimonies. And thank you to all other survivors who are here today. You inspire us with your courage, your resilience, and your hope. I'd like to note that as some of my own relatives were killed during a genocide, the Holocaust, I sympathize with the overwhelming pain and irreplaceable loss so many Rwandan friends feel. For almost 25 years now, I've had the honor of working in, writing on, and teaching about Rwanda, first as a practitioner working on the investigation and prosecution of genocidaire, and more recently as a law professor. During that time, I focus on listening and learning from Rwandans. It's been the honor of my life to be allowed by Rwandans to learn from them and for them to share with me their losses and hopes. I've been asked today to speak for approximately 20 minutes about lessons we can draw from the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. This year marks the 29th anniversary of the genocide. During 100 days in 1994, Hutu extremists slaughtered more than 1 million people, primarily Tutsi as well as moderate Hutu, and others who opposed the genocide. With a murder rate that some commentators estimate was three to five times faster than that of the Holocaust, the Tutsi genocide has been characterized as the most efficient mass killing since the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, I'm gonna to share lessons from the hell of those 100 days in 1994. The international community, including the United States, not only should, but must learn from Rwanda's experience before, during, and after the genocide against the Tutsi. Today, I'd like to share with you 10 such lessons that I think are especially relevant during the, the current era of deep political, racial, and other division around the world. Some of the lessons I'll share will focus on the United States, but they are no less relevant to other countries. 10 lessons I draw from the genocide against the Tutsi are hate speech is dangerous, atrocity prevention is possible, transitional justice is essential, sexual abuse is rampant, women's representation is crucial, genocide education is necessary, political will is vital, supporting survivors is fundamental, upstanderism is imperative, and never again is an unfulfilled platitude uttered again and again. In the interest of time, I'll focus my comments today on the first three and the final lessons. The first lesson is that hate speech, including state-sanctioned bigotry, is dangerous. In the years leading up to the genocide against the Tutsi, Hutu hardliners monopolized and manipulated local media to differentiate, dehumanize, and demonize Tutsi. The newspaper Kangura, meaning Wake Others Up in Kenya Rwanda, and other periodicals, as well as radio television Libre Nemil Kolin, RTLM, also known as Hate Radio, and Radio Rwanda were voices of extremism. Not only did these media outlets spew virulent anti-Tutsi propaganda that incited the genocide, but they also distributed specific instructions that directly helped execute these atrocities. Even years before the genocide in 1994, Kangura and other prominent newspapers and journals in Rwanda began printing articles and illustrations that were unapologetically and unambiguously anti-Tutsi. Some examples, Kangura falsely asserted the following, often projecting onto Tutsi exactly the preparations and acts of Hutu genocidaire, that Tutsi infiltrated and disproportionately occupied, if not dominated, positions of influence in Rwanda, that Tutsi militia members admitted that they had come to clean the country of the filth of Hutu, that Tutsi resemble uh, Nazis in their ideology and even adopted the Nazi swastika as their emblem, that Tutsi are cannibal, that Tutsi women were devious, deadly seductresses of Hutu men, and that Tutsi were planning a genocidal war on Hutu. Perhaps the most famous example of Kangura's incitement is its cover on this slide from December 1994, four months before the genocide erupted. 
The cover contains four elements. First, a, a photo of Gregoire Kayabanda, a former president of Rwanda who promoted Hutu majority power. Second, a sarcastic headline referring to Tutsi as the race of God. Third, the following question, what weapons can be used to finally defeat the Inyinzi, meaning cockroaches, one of many derogatory words used against Tutsi? And finally, as if to offer an answer to that question, a picture of a machete, one of the primary weapons that would soon be used to perpetrate the genocide. Radio was an even more effective means of communication than print media because of the relatively low literacy rate at the time in Rwanda. There's a traditional and popular oral culture in Rwanda. Many Rwandans owned radios, and the government reportedly distributed free radios before and even during the genocide. Radio Rwanda, the national radio station, was used as a mouthpiece of the government. It sometimes broadcasted inaccurate information. Because Rwandans had little access to independent media sources, the veracity of these claims was left unchecked. So, for example, in 1992, Radio Rwanda falsely declared that Tutsi were planning to kill certain Hutu leaders. And some suspect Radio Rwanda intended to encourage Hutu to slaughter Tutsi preemptively, which Hutu began doing the following day. RTLM Hate Radio was established in 1993 by pro-Hutu forces and, be, and began broadcasting later that year. One of the RTLM founders was Simon Bikindi, a popular musician for his anti-Tutsi songs. The lyrics of one song included in reference to Tutsi, remember this evil that should be driven as far away as possible so that it never returns to Rwanda. RTLM became popular among Hutu because it played lively music, showcased gossip, and reported supposed news that was often untrue in interviews that were often inaccurate. These are, these are the co-founders of RTLM, Jean Bosco Braiguiza and Ferdinand Nahimana, and the founder of Kangura, Hassan Ngeze. Beyond inciting the genocide, these and other media figures were instrumental in orchestrating the atrocities. After the genocide erupted, radio became even more important as a source of information and analysis for Rwandans than before the genocide, since the conflict inhibited travel and access to outside media. Officials of the interim government told Rwandans to listen to radio broadcasts, and RTLM urged Hutu to kill Tutsi. RTLM directed listeners to construct roadblocks and search for Tutsi generally, and specifically named individual people and areas that should be targeted. Radio Rwanda, the national radio station, aired similar instructions and information. Such propaganda mobilized hundreds of thousands of Hutu who felt compelled to attack Tutsi. Free speech is, of course, essential to an open society. However, we should recognize that there must be limits, and those limits must apply not only to the print and broadcast media that was so crucial to inciting and orchestrating the genocide against the Tutsi, but also to social media in today's world. A few years ago, Facebook acknowledged that it had been used to incite violence against Rohingya in Myanmar, where many have since characterized that violence as genocide. Social media, including Facebook, must do a better job enforcing its own code of conduct and engaging with civil society to combat hate speech and disinformation. A second lesson that can be drawn from the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda is that atrocity prevention is possible. Genocide and other atrocity crimes can be stopped and even averted in the first place. Historians have documented how the United Nations and countries such as the United States, France, and Belgium were aware of the genocide against the, the Tutsi, contrary to their declarations of, of ignorance, but failed to act effectively. If the United Nations had even modestly bolstered its peacekeeping presence already in the country, which was led by this man, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, it would likely have deterred or at least mitigated crimes against humanity. As Ms. Bauer noted, the solemn occasion of our webinar today occurs during Genocide Awareness Month, during which we commemorate other genocides as well, including the genocide against Armenians and Cambodians, as well as the Holocaust. Of course, genocide and other atrocity crimes have continued to rage around the world, from Syria and China to Ukraine and Myanmar. As a bipartisan report several years ago that was led by former Democratic Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and former Republican Secretary of Defense William Cohen concluded, such offenses threaten not only our values but also our interests because they cause refugee and regional crises 
as well as compromised U.S. leadership. These findings spurred passage of two bipartisan U.S. laws on atrocity prevention and response in recent years. In 2016 to 2017, while, uh, while I was on leave from academia to serve on the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff, I was honored to be a lead architect of both of these new federal laws. The Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act became law in 2018, and the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act became law the following year. These two laws do two things. First, they include strong statements declaring the importance of and the U.S. government's commitment to atrocity prevention. Second, they bolster the U.S. government's capacity to address atrocity crimes. These laws' laudable rhetoric should finally become reality. Amid the current extremely partisan era in U.S. politics, it's at least a symbolic achievement that the Elie Wiesel and Syrian War Crimes Accountability Acts received overwhelming bipartisan support. Ne By the way, I apologize if you can hear my daughter in the background. She's, uh, she's a little upset, maybe because I'm not playing with her. In any case, nevertheless, it's too early to tell how meaningfully the unprecedented yet imperfect laws will actually contribute to mitigating genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other atrocity crimes. A wide gulf has often existed between the rhetoric and reality of U.S. policy on atrocity prevention. In theory, these two laws hold great potential to relieve suffering and reinforce security. In practice, they may prompt major, minor, or even no change. Even if advancements the laws lead to are ultimately dramatic, they may only be aspirational and incremental for now. A third lesson to be drawn from the genocide against the Tutsi is that transitional justice is essential. The 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda is sometimes referred to as the most judged genocide in history. But it's crucial to remember that the genocide in 1994 was only the latest in a series of atrocity crimes that the country had faced over the prior half century. In light of the culture of impunity that had developed in Rwanda throughout previous decades and that contributed to the genocide in 1994, I'll briefly survey the major transitional justice initiatives implemented since the genocide. There have been four such mechanisms, two outside Rwanda, prosecutions through the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which I'll refer to as the ICTR, and prosecutions in foreign courts, foreign countries courts, and two inside Rwanda, prosecutions by ordinary domestic courts in Gachacha, which in Kenya Rwanda means the grass or the lawn, referring to the fact that its proceedings occurred outside while participants and observers sat or stood on the ground. These transitional justice mechanisms have sought to change what was a culture of impunity in Rwanda into a culture of accountability. This man is Colonel Theonis Bagasora on your screen. He was the military commander of the genocide and I was proud to have uh, worked on his prosecution that successfully ended with a conviction. So I'll start with the ICTR, uh, which was the ad hoc court created by the UN Security Council to prosecute suspected perpetrators of the genocide against the Tutsi. The ICTR was officially established in 1994 and formally closed in 2015. By its closure in 2015, the tribunal had sentenced 62 defendants to terms of up to life imprisonment, acquitted 14 suspects, referred 10 individuals to national courts, and referred three fugitives to a residual mechanism. Of the remaining four individuals, two died before judgment, and indictments against the other two were withdrawn before trial. Whether the ICTR fulfilled its mission has been a source of controversy since the tribunal's formation. Critics charged that the tribunal was consumed by nepotism, mismanagement, incompetence, inefficiency, waste, and insensitive treatment by witnesses of witnesses. They also assert that during the 21 years of its operation, the ICTR spent too much money, expended too much time, and occupied too many staff members for the completion of too few cases. Critics also argue that because of the ICTR's location in Tanzania, rather than in Rwanda itself, and what many viewed as an ineffective outreach program, many Rwandans were unaware of the tribunal's existence and progress. Others contend that the ICTR imposed sentences that were too lenient given the egregiousness of the crimes. Overall, the critics charged the ICTR did little to help build Rwanda's justice system, brought a meager number of genocidaire to justice, issued punishments that were too light, 
and did not sufficiently deter the commission of atrocities elsewhere in the world. Now, proponents of, this, of the ICTR, some of whom concede errors, assert that the enormity and complexity of the task before the ICTR necessitated a significant budget, large staff, long timeline, and the selective investigation and prosecution of suspects. They point to the ICTR successes as helping establish a historical record of the genocide, incapacitating at least some of the extremists and officially acknowledging the genocide itself and the suffering of victims. Defenders of the ICTR also note the significant legal precedents generated and other contributions to international law and justice that the tribunal made. In contrast to the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, as well as the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, all of which addressed international conflicts, the ICTR was the first international court to have jurisdiction over atrocity crimes committed during an internal conflict. The ICTR was also the first tribunal to receive a guilty plea for genocide, to impose a genocide conviction, to indict and subsequently convict a head of government for genocide, to clarify the definition of rape in international law and hold that it could constitute genocide, and to pass a genocide conviction of journalists. The ICTR's proponents ultimately claim, uh, claim that the tribunal, despite its limited mandate and resources, contributed significantly to accountability, reconciliation, and peace in Rwanda, and promoted atrocity deterrence more widely. These achievements, the ICTR's defenders argue, are important even if they haven't yet entirely manifested and will have been realized only in conjunction with other efforts, such as Rwanda's national and local justice systems, including Gachacha. The second transitional justice mechanism I'll briefly discuss is prosecution by foreign courts. Often invoking the controversial exercise of universal jurisdiction, some foreign countries have sought to hold accountable in their domestic courts suspected genocide air found within their borders. As an alternative to prosecutions for alleged conduct during the genocide, some countries in which suspected genocide air seek refuge have tried those individuals for lying on their immigration applications about their whereabouts and activities during the genocide. For example, since 2012, at least three Rwandans here in the United States in just New England were prosecuted for obscuring their connection to the genocide when seeking asylum. All three, Prudence Katengwa in 2012, Beatrice Munyenyenzi in 2015, and Jean Leonard Tagania in, 20, in 2019, were convicted of making such false statements. The third transitional justice mechanism I'll discuss is prosecution by Rwanda's ordinary courts. Towards the end of 1996, Rwanda's ordinary courts initiated prosecutions related to the genocide two years earlier. By the end of 2002, the Rwandan courts had tried approximately 8,000 suspects with an estimated 9.5% sentenced to capital punishment, 27.1% to life imprisonment, 40.5% to prison terms, and 19.1% were acquitted. In 1998, the Rwandan government publicly executed 22 individuals convicted by the Rwandan courts of genocide-related crimes. Even though death sentences would be imposed in Rwanda until 2003, these 1998 executions were the last actually carried out. The Rwandan government abolished the death penalty in 2007, which, among other things, paved the way for the ICTR, which was otherwise barred by its own rules of procedure and evidence from doing so, to transfer some of its cases to Rwanda. Like the ICTR, where, where fugitives from, from the Rwandan justice system have sought refuge abroad, the Rwandan government has requested compliance with arresting and extraditing suspected genocide air. Some foreign states have complied, while others have not. Even after the Rwandan government began prosecuting genocide offenders in 1996 in its ordinary courts, the government was unsatisfied with the pace of these trials. Reviving and revising Gachacha was thus an innovation born out of necessity. Rwanda needed to address its backlog of genocide cases. The post-genocide Gachacha courts originated from a traditional system of conflict resolution in Rwanda that was used by communities to promote, among other things, reconciliation among the families of antagonistic parties. After 1994, Rwanda decided to use Gachacha not only to deal with genocide cases, but also to rebuild the country's social fabric. In 2001, the Rwandan government enacted legislation establishing Gachacha courts. 
approximately 260,000 judges were elected, 260,000 judges, to preside over these courts. One commentator refers to the proportion of these elected judges relative to the country's adult population, which was about 6% at the time, as perhaps the largest experiment in popular justice in modern history. The Gachacha process officially operated for 10 years, from 2002 to 2012. In its report presented at the official closing of Gachacha, the Rwandan government stated that these courts had tried almost 2 million cases, convicting 86% and acquitting 14%. My colleague Phil Clark underscores the scale of the Gachacha enterprise with his observation that nearly every Rwandan adult had per has participated in Gachacha in some way either as a witness defendant or by attending weekly meetings. He characterizes Gachacha as the most comprehensive post-conflict justice program attempted anywhere in the world. The four tra uh, main transitional justice methods used to address the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, the ICTR, foreign courts, Rwanda's ordinary courts, and Gachacha mark a watershed in the development of international, foreign, domestic, and local transitional justice, respectively. Although imperfect, these mechanisms have helped combat the rampant impunity that pervaded Rwanda before 1994 and helped pave the way to the genocide. Still, the work these four innovative transitional justice bodies have accomplished is not yet complete. Suspected genocidaire remain at large. Tagania's conviction in Boston in 2019 for immigration fraud is a stark reminder that identifying and bringing genocidaire to justice is an ongoing challenge and imperative. Justice isn't just about quantity, it's also about quality. As I mentioned with the ICTR, regardless of how many cases have been addressed, serious criticism has been raised about some of these transitional justice mechanisms. And so we must evaluate them on their nature, not just their numbers. Full justice after genocide is of course impossible. And so even while engaged in this necessary work to promote accountability and deterrence, we must take to heart that nothing will ever truly make up for such unimaginable loss. A final lesson from the genocide against the Tutsi that I want to discuss is that never again is an unfulfilled platitude uttered again and again. It has become almost a rule for my fellow genocide prevention and transitional justice scholars and practitioners to end lectures by invoking never again. I won't, or at least I won't in the way that phrase, that phrase usually is used. Never again is usually used to declare that we humans will never again permit the deliberate targeting of a group of us for eradication. But given that genocides have continued unabated, this pronouncement obviously rings hollow. Genocide has continued since Armenia, since the Holocaust, since Cambodia, since Rwanda. Just a year after the Tutsi genocide, genocide was perpetrated in Srebrenica. Since then, genocides have been committed in Darfur and against the Yazidi, Rohingya, and Uyghurs. Genocide continues today. We have no reason to believe it won't continue in the future. In fact, some predict that we may see more and more genocide as climate change increases competition for scarce resources. So drawing from the other nine lessons I've shared with you today, I will use never again differently. Never again must we take hate speech lightly. Never again must we think preventing or stopping genocide is impossible. Never again must we allow impunity for genocide. Never again must we fail to combat sexual abuse. Never again must we decline to promote women's representation. Never again must we disregard genocide education. Never again must we permit political unwillingness to address genocide. Never again must we neglect survivors. Never again must we be bystanders to genocide. And never again must we declare never again unless we remember and implement these lessons. Thank you once again for the honor of speaking to you today, Marcosi. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, that was incredibly enlightening and educating. And we have some very comprehensive questions that have been submitted. And I encourage all of our attendees to continue submitting questions as we um, go through this conversation. I think that. Um, on the heels of Professor Kaufman's um, presentation, there's one that is really um, applicable, which would be 
that you mentioned that there are gaps between U.S. federal laws for atrocity prevention and aspirational language and actual accountability and practice. Um, I can tell this question was submitted probably by a law student. What are some key actions um, that you think are needed to bridge these gaps? Well, thank you um, from the anonymous uh, um, submitter for, for your question. Um, as, as you, you know, observe, and as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, there, there is a significant gap between the, the rhetoric and reality of, of atrocity prevention by the U.S. government. Um, history is filled with examples of um, the United States either uh, responding too late or not at all to atrocity crimes, uh, and, um, and, and this continues, uh, you know, even today, obviously. Um, so the, 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 the situation is that, uh, as I mentioned with these two new laws, the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act, um, and by the way, many others, um, there are legal mechanisms that are already in place that would uh, enable uh, atrocity prevention and atrocity response. There's also a, a massive amount of capacity uh, within the United States, all across uh, the government, um, whether it's uh, in the Department of Defense, uh, the Department of Justice, the intelligence community, and elsewhere, um, to, to monitor, um, to even anticipate, uh, and to try to deter and respond to, um, and even intervene in, uh, atrocity crimes. What is lacking so clearly is political will. Um, that is the key part of the of the the key ingredient uh, in this in this recipe for atrocity prevention and mitigation um, that that uh, is is most glaringly absent. Um, and unless and until we have political leaders who are more willing um, to expend uh, political capital um, to uh, to to uh, deter to to. Um, intervene to assist, uh, you know, rebel groups that are fighting against genocide perpetrators. Um, there's any number of things that can be done uh, to equip, um, to provide even defensive, um, you know, equipment and radios, uh, as is currently being done in in Ukraine. Unless and until that's that's done, um, then we'll continue to see this gap between the rhetoric and reality of uh, of U.S. atrocity prevention uh, continue. Um, and that uh, I, I should add is, is, is certainly a, a an extremely sad, disappointing, and highly consequential uh, effect of of the of the gap. Thank you. So there are a few other questions in here. One is directed towards Providence and Henriette both. Um, pointing out that there is a current policy of the government of Rwanda to abolish the tribal identity of people of Rwanda entirely, um, and essentially asking your opinion on if this is a solution to a chronic issue of ethnic identity um, and, and asking you to weigh in on that. I think I can answer on this one. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the Rwandan uh, government made a, a right decision to remove, you know, the tribal uh, Hutu and Tutsi, um, how they were mentioned in our IDs, because this was not going to help in any way. Like it has been before used to identify Tutsis only to be killed and the Hutus to feel like they are superior to the Tutsis. So the fact that it has been removed was towards the total reconstruction to rebuild the country with no Hutu or Tutsi because if people have to come together, Hutu and Tutsis have to come together to rebuild the country, they had to leave behind the Hutu and Tutsis. You know, one saying I belong here and another one I belong in this ethnic group. So didn't affect anything and uh, it, it helped in a way that the country knew 100% that the uh, residents, the natives of Rwanda are all uh, leaded in the same direction. And uh, the fact that the ID has bad memories for the Tutsis who were asked, uh, who were, <clears throat> 
asked to bring the IDs to be able to uh, be identified, I think it was a release to us, a relief, something that was bringing uh, peace to our hearts that this uh, piece of identity that only was uh, being used to be killed is removed. So it's a positive thing. And uh, the country that doesn't have the ID, of course, is showing good results to operate better. And uh, a lot of things have been done without this ID. So this is, I think, the first time the leadership removed the ID with Hutu and Tutsi, and Tutsi uh, ethnic groups. And then uh, we can judge that it has been a success to the country since this hasn't been used for a long time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the next question is, I believe to all of our panelists, do you believe that the RPF slash RUF has appropriately and proficiently prosecuted the genocidaires involved? I'm happy to, to start um, and then, you know, certainly welcome uh, comments from uh, my esteemed panelists, co-panelists here. Um, you know, the, part of the problem, so over a million people uh, were, were involved in perpetrating the genocide. There, there's some statistics that hold that as many people killed as were killed. And if that is the truth, then it's, you know, well over a million uh, people. And, and, you know, from what we can tell from the from the convictions from the Gachacha process, it, it certainly was, um, you know, well over a million people who participated. Um, with that many people, um, and with the fact that the Rwandan justice system was decimated uh, during, during the genocide, I mean, so much of the infrastructure uh, in Rwanda was just absolutely obliterated as part of the, uh, the conflict. Um, you know, it, it's miraculous. It's, it, it really is nothing short of a miracle. Um, about how much uh, justice and accountability ha has been made uh, already. I don't think it's ever going to be possible, probably, unfortunately, to um, apprehend and, and prosecute uh, everyone uh, who is involved. There are some people who have escaped to the far corners of the planet um, and are living under assumed identities. Um, this is all the more reason it's incumbent upon um, foreign countries to, you know, continue um, to, to seek out uh, genocidaire who are living abroad. Um, but even in, in Rwanda itself, there are, uh, you know, um, individuals who, um, you know, for whom maybe there was no remaining evidence um, that, they, that, that they had uh, participated in the genocide because they killed everybody uh, who could have been an eyewitness. Um, so there, there are circumstances um, that that lead to uh, continued impunity, um, and that that is a, a tragedy, and also um, you know a, a deficit uh, in the in the um, uh, the cause of justice uh, and accountability. Um, but again, uh, tremendous strides have already been made, um, and you know are continuing to be made uh, to to try to promote uh, justice and accountability and. Um, the entire world needs to to cooperate together um, on that on that endeavor. Henriette and Pruvi, I don't I don't know if you want to add anything to that. So I was trying to I was mute and I didn't know how to do this. I think I need to learn more about my phone. So uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I would say uh, just to echo what it, uh, Isaac said that. Um, the government of Rwanda have really done a humongous, tough, and and you know, job of uh, bringing those genociders to to the trial through our um, church system. And um, I mean, it's it's not that easy for sure. Like what he was saying, um, more than a million people who participated in genocide, and some families that we totally killed. There is nobody who can you know who has survived to testify what they've seen during genocide. And the other issue that you say that we have a lot of people, even here in America and other countries in the world who, um, because of the atrocities that are happening in, in 
a surrounding country like a Congo, Burundi, you know, it was so much easier for the perpetrators to go to Burundi and change their name and, and get identity over there. The country is very corrupted. Or go to Congo DRC, change their name. We have a lot of gen, gen, genociders who is in America, who are in America or in Europe with the Congolese uh, ID or uh, passport. So, but whoever was in the country and who committed a genocide, who, who was involved, and the government really did their best and they did a good job. But also the main thing that I really, really liked about this gachacha that maybe those who are watching us that you don't, you don't understand, you know, it's, it's rooted in tradition where our community, if your, your brother belonged to you, you were married in somewhere in front of the house and you invited the neighbors and the people you trust in the community, the people you trust in the village, those people that those are the people who participate and then make a decision based on the testimony from different people, but also for us survivors, it was a, it was a such a healing to uh, to be in those courts. Yes, it's true, it was not easy, but to be in those courts to to get it to know what had happened to your family because. Uh, most of survivors of genocide were hidden and did not see how their family, and some of us, we still don't know where our family members were thrown during genocide. So those uh, traditional cards, uh, the perpetrators were able to, some of them, to share exactly what ha had happened. It was su such a closure and we needed that. So it, I think it was a very powerful. Now, I think a lot of need to be done. You know, like Isaac was saying, we need to be serious about this crime of genocide and making sure that everybody who committed genocide faced justice. And this is the justice for us. And I think that's what I have to share with that. Yeah. Uh... I think I can say something about it too. Uh, how uh, the memory of the genocide affects Rwanda, I can um, be sure that we think as a Rwandan or in the survivor, I think that Rwanda exists right after the genocide. I don't have anything in my mind that reminds me of Rwanda. Of course, I understand that before the genocide, Tutsi, they went through threats. They were not allowed to go to school. So there was no development. There was no good thing allowed for to the Tutsi community. So Rwanda, in the, the memory of the genocide, it's that Rwanda is doing better. So it's like the Rwanda is existing after the genocide. And we count in Rwanda after the genocide. Everybody, every Rwandan, every, you know, you all the time find yourself saying before the genocide and after the genocide, there is no Rwanda before or all the time we are counting Rwanda after the genocide because before the genocide, there was nothing. Myself, I tend to think that the genocide and the life before the genocide was a dream because what we went through was something beyond imagination. My parents, my father, my family, you know, my aunts, they were not allowed to go to school. So there was no Rwanda before. Rwanda only exists after the genocide because our leadership is doing an outstanding job to bring people together and to reconstruct the country. And of course, the Rwanda will always find all the time will be, you know, Rwanda and genocide, memory of the genocide will go hand in hand because Rwanda has to do everything in its capacity to rebuild the country, not to be defined by the genocide, but a, a resilient country in the country that is trying to do everything to fight this genocide from happening again. Because once you go through something, that's when you know it's going to happen again. And if it's happening, like as a leader, as a president, what am I gonna do? Am I really, you know, uh, going to allow this thing to happen again? So we are doing everything we can for this thing you not know, to happen again. And also, Rwanda uh, and the society and the genocide, I can say that um, genocide memory affected Rwanda and the society because 
as everybody knows, we understand the genocide as time goes by. That's when we get to see that we don't have family members. Our kids are asking for grandparents, aunties and uncles. We are growing up, we understand what victims went through when they had children, what victims went through when kids were crying, asking, mom, where are we going? Why are we not going back home? We need to nap, we need food, you know, those kind of things, innocent babies were asking. That's when we get to understand now that we have children, now that we are growing up. So we are living with the genocide every day from the 1st of January through the 31st of December. So this is something that is going with us our whole life. And uh, our, our generation is affected by trauma and this is not gonna go anywhere. We have survivors, they were abused sexually and they live with HIV AIDS for 29 years. So every uh, corner of a Rwandan community is affected by the genocide. And all we're doing is to try to erase the consequences, but it, this is not something we can be able to do because genocide is something unimaginable, unspeakable. You can't be able to define what it is. So we will live with it, but we will find ways to live with it. What we want now is to make sure this is not happening again to us. It's not happening again to anybody else. And uh, as I'm talking about this, it's really something to regret that Tutsis and other victims of the genocide were abandoned. We are trying to see that um, if something like this happens again, the victims are going to have help on the way or they are going to die desperate. How uh, most powerful leaders of the world, of course, UN didn't do anything. Tutsis, and as Ariette mentioned, they were early signs, but nobody did a thing. So there is nothing we can, you know, do to stop what happened in the past. We cannot undo this thing, but for sure, we can prevent it from happening because if we have to live with the genocide and the consequences, of course, that is being transfer, uh, transferred to the youngest generation. I mean, our children who are all the time scared that we may, you know, die young or leave them behind like we're left behind as orphans. Then we live with the genocide, but um, we hope that it doesn't happen again. Thank you for this question. I have one more thing to say, if it's okay. Hello, do I have a minute to say something? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to add that uh, when the, yes, the RPF have tried, but I wanted to mention this, when this genocide ha was happening, when a million of people were being killed, nobody, no help came to us. These uh, perpetrators of genocide, they are all over the world. And my hope is our people cannot do, uh, our Rwandan government cannot do justice itself and make sure that everybody who committed justice, uh, uh, genocide faces justice. I hope other nations now, today, as I'm speaking, that they can help us everywhere where those people are and bring them to justice. I guarantee you if this genocide have happened in the US or in other country in Europe, that those perpetrators of genocide, if they will happen to be change their name and go to you know, Africa or other countries, this is just a scenario that everybody in America, in this country, that we stand up together, that we make sure they find those people and bring them to justice. But because it happened to us, those people who killed our families, some of them are here, you know, living their dream life in the US or in America, they have changed the name, like nothing is being done to make sure that we bring those uh, people to justice. I think our country need other people since, since you, they just watched us, it is happening, no help has come to us. At least this time around, if they can help us bring those people to justice, because I know it's possible and I know they can do it. And I know that if this genocide have happened in the US, it was going to be different. That's what I have to add. 
Thank you. Um, one next question to Professor Kaufman, um, asking about the fact that the first um, ICTR conviction was um, a woman of rape and genocide and asking to weigh in on that. Um, yeah, the, the the questioner is absolutely right. Um, and, and unlike some of the other questioners identified themselves. So uh, hello to Elizabeth Barad, who I know from the, the New York City uh, Bar Association. Um, so uh, Ms. Barad is, is absolutely right that um, among the, the many other precedents that were set uh, by the ICTR, um, we had the, the first woman to be convicted for genocide. Ironically, um, she was at the time, you know, uh, had been the the um, minister for family and women's affairs, uh, if you can believe it, um, in in the the genocidal government, um, uh, when you know that was the capacity in which she was uh, convicted for what she had done. Um, so the, the the number of precedents and, and the variety of precedents, uh, as I mentioned, and as uh, Ms. Broad has now has now added on to, um, contributed by the ICR is undeniable. And and again, I was proud to serve there. Um, on the the team that can, that that ultimately convicted DNS Bagasora, um, I, I I just wanted to uh, mention again, you know, that there are significant criticisms uh, of of the tribunal. Um, one thing that I didn't mention and that has now been brought up by by my co panelists here um, is some of the inconsistency, if not hypocrisy, that uh, we see in in international justice. So, you know, one of the things that leaps out to me about the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda is that it asserted what's called primary jurisdiction uh, over the genocide. And so basically what that means is that the tribunal could take any cases it wanted, um, regardless of whether the Rwandan government, for example, wanted to prosecute certain individuals. And the, the irony here is that the United Nations abandoned the Tutsi in their greatest time of need and then decided to assert control uh, over the, uh, the the lead cases, the most egregious cases, at least as determined um, by the ICTR, um, regardless of whether the Rwandan government in, in its you know, wisdom would have preferred to prosecute and as part of their catharsis and um, in, in way of sort of um, dealing with the past. Um, and, and that's just sort of one sort of challenge. Interestingly, and, and this is one of the lessons that I think we can draw from, from the, the genocide against the Tutsi and the surrounding transitional justice mechanisms, is that the, the dominant international war crimes tribunal today, the international, the permanent international criminal court doesn't work that way, or at least isn't supposed to work that way. Um, so through Article 17 of the Rome Statute, which is the treaty underlying the international criminal court, the ICC is supposed to defer um, to national uh, courts um, if they are willing and able genuinely uh, to, to prosecute cases. So the ICC only is supposed to act if uh, the, the relevant national court is unwilling or unable genuinely to prosecute. Um, and so that's the, the opposite of what happened in the case uh, of the ICTR. Um, and I only mention that because as we're acknowledging rightly, um, the important legal precedents and historical precedents that that were established by the ICTR and the various other uh, contributions that it made, um, I think we also need to to recall and emphasize um, the ICTR's deficiencies and and other controversies uh, about its design and operation. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I want to kind of harken back to a, the question before the last one, um, where both Providence and Henriette talked about how, you know, if this were, if this happened in the U.S., um, it would have been handled really differently and how you are spending your careers and your lives educating people about what happened. And I know um, that you both are very active in multiple organizations and commissions to educate people. And I was wondering if you could both share a little bit about, um, you know, the activity, the the organizations that you're part of now um, and ways that people listening might be able to engage with educating people and learning more about 
genocides generally and the Rwandan um, genocide against the um, Tutsi and, and kind of how people can move forward from, from today? Well, let me begin. Um, we educated people in other countries, but also uh, one of the things that I do, I have a nonprofit organization called Million Lives. Uh, the nonprofit organization focused on uh, uh, people who are facing post-traumatic stress disorder in my country because it is a big issue till now. Um, after genocide, a big percentage of survivors of genocide till now they are still suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, which was really um, a new thing in our, in our culture to see somebody traumatized. We didn't even have a name for it. It was very new. So, and I, working, I worked with the survivors of genocide for many years. The very first genocide memorial center in Ichigari. I worked there for four years, and I, and I, and I learned how what a trauma can do to human being, and how much it can be transmitted. Because for those who has a knowledge about trauma it can be transmitted from one generation to another generation. So what I do, one of the things I do is to educate our people, what is trauma? Because a lot of them, they don't even know that what trauma can do to their family and it's, they live with them. So you have to educate them in the villages to tell them this is serious, you need to seek for therapies. We also provide some therapies to help them and help them in other, you know, round out program, but also, I tell myself that uh, I lived the genocide. I left the people, I lost people during genocide. Uh, I've seen the early warnings of genocide. The genocide doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I've seen the propaganda, what the propaganda can do to a nation, to people, to families. And I tell myself that it is my mission to educate even people in this country, my adopted country, which is America, because nobody is immune to what happened to us. I've seen America, I've been in America for 14 years. It's becoming a very divided and divided that I have never seen. America's changing. Wake up, guys, something is happening and it's not a good. So my mission is to go to people and, uh, and show them and tell them exactly, here's where you are. Because a lot of people, um, it, it started to see what the division happening in America and uh, being somebody who experiencing the genocide and, uh, in my country, I, can, I know what it can do to communities and families. So I go to schools, churches, families. If you call me, I'm always available. I have, I can just talk and that's it. And, and thank you guys for, for, um, for giving us space to share the, our, our painful story because not everybody give us a space. Space is very important for survivors of genocide. Sometimes we just need the spaces for people who can hear our stories and validate our stories and listen to us. Sometimes that's what we need. So if somebody like um, Professor Zachary and everybody who um, from university who contributed to this time around, it's it's priceless. It's thank you so much. I really appreciate it for giving us this this you know safe place so we can share our story. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, as uh, you mentioned in the introduction, I am a state commissioner in the genocide, the Holocaust, and uh, anti-Semitism anti-Semitism advisory commission, and. Uh, to educate about the genocide. So uh, I was talking about the genocide because I'm a genocide survivor. And as soon as I was learning about the Holocaust, I was, you know, surprised to see that the anti-Semitism is really, really on the rise. And with all the time that had passed, still this hate directed toward, towards Jewish people is still existing now that we are talking. And as a survivor, I was shocked. Like, how is this still happening now? What are we doing? So in my work, I talk about my experience, the genocide, to educate people about the genocide. Of course, today the world know about our genocide because we have genocide deniers who are saying the genocide never happened. Genocide was never prepared. We have some people who are asking, oh, are you sure the genocide killed only Tutsis or was for both sides? And 
I know it's our job as genocide survivors to stand and tell them that the genocide happened and we were there. We have stories to share. And because we know how this uh, genocide hurt us and it's going to hurt our children, of course, then we don't need this to happen again. And all of a sudden we keep seeing this, you know, anti-Semitism comments everywhere. And because of, of a country of freedom of speech, people are still doing it because they can do whatever they want. And like serious sanctions must be put in place. If a parent gets to a point, a baby's crying when they're trying to hide, and the baby and uh, the parent decides to um, to choke a baby crying with a pillow. This is a testimony I heard when I was uh, visiting the Houston Holocaust Museum. As a mother, I put myself in this, you know, mother's spot who decided to silence the baby crying because they needed to at least to live one day and save other people who were in the same room, then this is something really, really serious that everybody has to stand up for. And that's why I have to do this. I sometimes joke that till I blow my last breath, I'll be talking about the genocide and I won't really, really tolerate somebody who thinks this hatred towards the Jewish people is a normal thing to do. They don't deserve to live in peace. Then this is our responsibility as genocide survivors to help the community understand the dangers of this hate that is all the time happening. Nobody's doing a thing. If we have few people who are doing it, but at least we make sure it's a constant work we are doing to make sure at least these people who have been hurt in the past are not being hurt again. If we see a baby boy, who is wearing a keeper is not free to walk in the airports or on the streets of New York or Paris, then what is, you know, why is this happening in 2023? This is our job. This is our job. And uh, Dr. King, Luther King said, if you are a neutral in the situation of aggression, you're standing with the oppressor. So we have to make right decisions. We have to be upstanders to stand and do something that is right. Also, <clears throat> I advocate for women who were abused sexually because females, they went through something I can't be able to define. If you visit Rwanda, you read the story, you visit the museum and you see what they went through. Even if all the victims went through torture, then in our culture, it's not something really easy to discuss, to address about, you know, rape and everything. So as a survivor who was young and who is fortunate enough to live in this powerful country, I know my voice is going to help in raising awareness of what women went through. But also my children were born in this country. I, I need them to be in peace. I need them to live in a peaceful community to make a difference where they go and to have peace and to have a, a community where they are tolerated. That's why I'm doing this for them to go make impact and for us to make sure our children, somebody's children, my friend, my neighbor, community, we live in peace because we don't want anybody to live what we went through. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to Henriette and Providence for sharing your testimonies. I can't imagine that it's really hard to talk about, but as you have just eloquently mentioned, um, it's making a huge difference and educating people about what you went through and um, about everything that has happened since is, is making a difference. And we really thank you for your time, especially considering both of you are in very different time zones and um, have a lot going on right now. And for Professor Kaufman, uh, your presentation was incredibly educational, very helpful. And um, I hope that you get to spend some time with your daughter who is 
clearly really excited to spend some time with you. And um, thank you to all of our attendees and our many, many co-sponsors who helped us get this event together. We did have some other questions that we weren't able to get to, but we really wanna thank everybody for submitting their questions and listening attentively today. And I hope that you all have a great day, morning or night, wherever you're calling in from. And uh, if, if anybody has a question, feel free to email it to us so we can, I can definitely answer um, if there is any way you can get my email. I think if there's any way we can share the email, I don't know. For anybody who has a question, I don't know where you can uh, probably uh, type in my email and then they can submit those questions to me uh, on in a chat, right? Let me, let me type in my email. I just added my email address too. Ooh, I did it wrong. I have to type it in again. Thanks to, thanks to everybody. And thanks, of course, to Pruby Henriette and, and Georgia for all your contributions today. Zach, Professor Zach. Yes. Make sure you get it, you give an A, everybody who attended. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Starting Fair with deal. <laughs> 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 and thank you to the American Society of International Law, uh, Taylor and Jimmy, for uh, for organizing this, for hosting this, for facilitating uh, everything, for being with us uh, today. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Bye. Are we...